Good afternoon. How are you? How excited are you? We have Lee Pace here today. Okay. Thank you, Florence, and good afternoon. My guest is one of the finest actors working on stage, screen, and television, and is known to millions of fans around the world for his diverse film work. He is an actor who is always singled out by the critics and admired by audiences for everything he does. His breakout role was that of transsexual Calpurnia Adams in Soldier's Girl, which garnered him the Gotham Award for Breakthrough Actor. On film, he has worked with such famed directors as Steven Spielberg in the Oscar-winning film Lincoln, for Peter Jackson in the Hobbit trilogy, for Bill Condon in the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part Two. Fans here? for Tom Ford in A Single Man, and for Robert De Niro in The Good Shepherd. Go right ahead. Other films include Infamous, The White Countess, Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, and Ceremony. On television, he is known for such series as the cult favorite Pushing Daisies. And for four seasons on AMC's Halt and Catch Fire. On stage, he made his Broadway debut in Larry Kramer's groundbreaking play, The Normal Heart, for which he and his fellow cast members, including Jim Parsons, Joe Mantello, John Benjamin Hickey, and Ellen Barkin, received the coveted Drama Desk Award for Best Ensemble. His other stage work includes Terrence McNally's Golden Age, starring opposite B.B. Newworth and F. Murray Abraham, Small Tragedy, for which he won an Obie Award, Guardians, and The Fourth Sister. He has also entered the world of Marvel Comics, yeah. playing the role of Ronin in the worldwide phenomenon, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. And he's about to return as Ronin in Captain Marvel. Well, he is back on Broadway, electrifying audiences eight times a week as Joe Pitt in Tony Kushner's two-part epic, Angels in America, opposite Nathan Lane and Andrew Garfield. Please welcome Lee Pace. Hello. I, oh, thank you for that nice introduction. It's so nice of you. Hello. Yep. Well, first off, welcome back to Broadway and Angels in America. How does it feel? Uh, terrifying at times and, uh, and uh, really exhilarating. Um, yeah, it just feels really good. It's a, a real privilege to be back with this play and with this cast and with this director. Yeah. Mm. You are a revelation on stage as Joe Pitt. I have seen, we talked about this upstairs, I have seen all other New York productions of this play, but you bring this new level of emotional pain and yearning for something else that your Joe wants that I had never seen before in anyone else. Mm -hmm. For all of you who have, how many of you have already seen the show? I know you've seen yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of you who haven't, just to watch this man work along with this incredible ensemble of actors is pretty phenomenal. Um, what is it like living in this play by Tony Kushner? I mean, I wish I could say it was fun, but it's not. <laughs> it's really, it's not fun at all. It's, it's, um, there's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it is painful. It's painful and complicated. And uh, there was something I saw in the character when I first started working on it that was um, just very vulnerable about him. And once I saw that, I didn't, uh, there was no way to escape it. And, um, and that's really the, the, the situation I find myself in right now, <laughs> is, is every night kind of, kind of having to um, be vulnerable in this, in this way and with this room full of people. Um, that, that's, I guess, the, biggest, the, the best way I could describe the experience is, is yeah. that. You know, it's like when you say too much to people you don't know and you walk away and you feel a little bit like... <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a little bit what I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> this was a play that you always wanted to do, isn't it? It is a play. I've, I've, um, I first read the play when I was in high school. Um, I was, you know, 15. I went to a high school in the suburbs of Houston, Texas. 
and um, and I mean, I didn't know. I mean, I was 15. What do you know when you're 15? Um, and uh, and the fact that this play landed in my lap at that age, I think, was completely transformative. Yeah. You know, in my understanding of you know life and love and identity and you know what this country is and what it's capable of. And um, so I've known it for a long time. And I would love to, I wish I would have had, you know, when you have, when you write in, the, in your books, which I did when I was 15, kind of, you know, pathologically. <laughs> but, but you lose those books along the way during your moves and stuff, and you don't have all those notes you read. But I would have loved to have had my copy of Angels to, to see what my impressions of these characters were and what this world was. because. I mean, I hadn't gone through a breakup at that point. I had no idea about, you know, what these things were, yeah. you know? But now I'm, you know, you know, playing this character inside of it, and I do know a little bit more about what they, what they are. And, um, and, yeah, so it's a different impression of what the play is. Yeah. Having Tony Kushner in the room with you when you were rehearsing, was he there a lot? Not a lot, okay. not a lot, but I, 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 uh, um, I did a movie that Tony wrote called Lincoln, um, and he, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what a thrilling few days on set that was, because yeah. we, we shot in, um, in Richmond, at the state capitol in Richmond, and there was this, you know, incredible room full of actors, um, and they'd all been assigned, okay, you'll be a Republican from Maine, you're a Democrat from, you know, from Indiana, and, and they'd all read Doris Kern Goodwin's book, you know, about Lincoln. Yeah. Um, and they had, like, perspectives on what their state was fighting for. And so when we got in there and we started arguing this stuff, it was like this incredible, big, loud improv that happened. I mean, I've just never seen kind of actors working on that scale before. Yeah. You know, so many, it was like 200 people in the room, and they all kind of had a character and a point of view and, a, you know, and it would just erupt with this big argument. I mean, talk about a scene partner. Yeah. But that was, that was, um, so that was uh, the first time I'd met Tony and, um, and, but he wasn't around the rehearsal room too much, but we've talked about, we got outside and had coffee and talked about, you know, oh, so many things. I could listen to Tony talk all day and night. He's um, just the most, um, poetic, insightful person, you know, and he's got such an extraordinarily big heart, and yeah. I think you see that inside this play, you know, the, the level of grace in adversity, you know, kind of crushing adversity, to have grace inside that is, you know, not easy, yeah. and, um, and, but, but he shows you it's possible and necessary. Yeah. Did you have like insightful conversations about Joe or the time period he wrote the piece, like when you would go out for coffee? While you oh were yeah, 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 many conversations about Joe and yeah. who you know who he is, who he is today. I think a lot about Joe. I mean, it was done twenty five years ago on on Broadway, this play, and that's just not too long ago. I mean, that's that's not that's not really history. That's today. Really, you know, that's not that's not too far back, um, and so I think a lot about who Joe was then and and who he might be today. Yeah, mm, you beautiful. Know. Your portrayal of Joe Pitt is the perfect melding of artist and role. How do you connect to him so personally? Is it through the text or? Well. I mean, I guess it's with, with this character. There was, there was when I approached it. I, I kind of thought, well, because we were, we're very different in so many ways. Um, but I, I couldn't help but think, like, where, you know, where are we similar? Um, and I, and I, it, it, within the play, Joe goes through the most excruciating three months of his life, the most painful, transformative. You know, it's like the house just burns down so that he can start again. Um, and who, I mean, everyone knows that, right? We all know that. We all know that moment where 
you know, the person you've been madly in love with is just not the person you can live with. You know, the person that you thought you were is not correct, you know? And that's what this man goes through. And then you, you, you show up with that. And with the, I mean, I take the, in, in the play, the, the, this, the, the metaphor of the, sh the snake shedding his skins um, and how painful that is, you know? When a, shake, a snake sheds its shin, it skin, it sheds it from the eyeballs, everything. Everything goes away. Um, and, and I think about in my own life those moments where it's been like, I think it's time to grow, you know, to um, address the things that need to be addressed and, and really look at... at Joe, it, it, it's important to him to be a good man. Yeah. It's important to me to be a good man. You know, that's another kind of connective tissue with him, to do the right thing with the time you've got, to treat people well, to make an impact that is uh, positive and meaningful and thoughtful. Um, and I, I believe Joe wants those things, um, and they're very important to him. And, 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 in, and g given the, 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 the challenges that he's given in the play, he meets those challenges with a real sense of what is the right thing to do now. Like, who do I, who am I now? Um, the, the, I don't know. I, 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 I'm, in, I'm in the middle of playing him, and so I could yeah. just bore you to no, all day about all. No, listen, I can... there's all actors out here, you know, <laughs> figuring out how you craft a role. Talk about working with and sharing the stage with this remarkable group of actors, all at the top of their game. I mean, it's, it's I mean, can I just say watching them yeah. work is phenomenal yeah. because I, I'm if I'm not on stage I'm backstage kind of watching what's happening and like with Andrew for example I don't have many scenes with him um, so I get to watch a lot of what he does and his the amount of energy and you know artistry that he's bringing to that role is astonishing you know to see what he does every night with Nathan I get to share you know, some scenes with him, and it is every bit as good as, you can, as, you, as you're thinking it is. To see how he masterfully attacks this beast of a role is just thrilling. Like, thrilling. Every night, there's, within this kind of, you know, very thoughtful parameters of the character that he's made, there's this living... Um, uh, charm and uh, ferociousness to what he does. Uh, I mean, that I, you know, I was telling you backstage, I, I, I'm still learning about what that relationship is. I'm still learning about, oh, that's what that means. That's what I'm trying to communicate there. You know, that's what I learn in that scene. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's just, I mean, a privilege to, and, I, and every night, I think it, there's a scene in, um, in Millennium in Act Three, that is, you know, the scene where I go in and tell him I can't take the job, which is, you know, for the whole first half of the play, it's just been like, ah, oh, this job, if I can just get it together to get to Washington, then everything is going to be fine. You know, it's like Moscow and Three Sisters. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, if I can just get there, then everything will be fine, everything will be fixed, and it's just a fantasy, you know, that it could happen. Um, so it's like a real moment of reckoning going in there. And what he meets me with is this, you know, ferocious reality of either you're a winner or you're a loser, you know, in life, you know, which is to Joe to hear that at that moment is, you know, it's like the walls of the castle come tumbling down. It's know. so interesting because it's such this beautifully... It's like a beautiful claustrophobic scene. It's just the mm. two of you going back at each other, and then that explosion happens. Really great. Mm. You are working with one of the finest directors with Marianne Elliott. What specifically makes her such a wonderful director? Um, I mean, she's a visionary. Yeah. It, 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 she's got this, you know, the, that she's cracked this play open in the way she has is <laughs> remarkable. The, her conception of the angel of America in this moment in time, uh, her interpretation of Tony. I mean, it's, it's just creativity 
you know, working at this incredible level. Yeah. And the, there's nothing I admire more in someone than who is, you know, creative in that way that she is. You know, it's cool that, I mean, the set just is dope. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like the, the neon, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, that's, putting all those pieces together is I think what, you know, I, I, I've loved about working with her is yeah. to being a part of this, this vision that she has of this world. It's brilliant, because after seeing all these productions, you wouldn't think that anybody could bring anything else to this, and then she has just cracked the eggshell and taken it somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know? And the way she kind of, she finds the symbols. I remember she was talking to us about um, Act Four in Perestroika, which is the whole middle act of when you watch it. She said, it's acid, it's acid green. It's the way Ethel describes the star. You know, I, you know I, I've been praying and dreaming for your death all these years, and I've made a star in the sky because of it. That's the whole play is that kind of, or that whole act is this acid green. And I think about it every night because it is the hardest act for the character that, I, that I'm playing. It's after I've, you know, stripped Bear on Joan's Beach and am trying to live an authentic life, but, you know, it's not working out. <laughs> you know, I, I had the privilege of seeing both parts of Angels on the same day. What are double days like for you? I mean, it's like, let me just describe this to you. Like, you, do you watch, do you, I'm a huge fan of the Olympics. Who else likes the, the Olympics, right? Is like one of the, the high divers. You get up on the, on the diving board and you see them kind of stand there and like look at how far they're about to drop yeah. and just take a breath and remember how they're going to flip their body and spin and turn and somehow land safely in that water. <laughs> That's what it feels like when you yeah. start an act of this play, because you know, oh, I've got to do these things, but who knows what's going to happen, <laughs> actually. Yeah. You know, many, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, it's different. It is different every time. Wow. It really is. Um, so that's how it feels, and it's terrifying and thrilling, and when it's over, it feels so good yeah. to kind of just feel like, <laughs> there, that's done. You know, That's I didn't a die. Metaphor, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to do it again. I didn't die. I have to do it again. <laughs> I have to climb the ladder again. Get up on the diving board. Like yeah. you said, like you just said, exhausting but exhilarating all at the same time. Yeah, it is, and it's and challenging too. Yeah. And there, and I love a challenge. I love that. You know, there have been times working on this that I've really thought I can't do it. Like it's just it's it's too. Why would I want to? <laughs> you know, it's too, you know, what, what's the benefit of putting myself through this? What is the, um, it's, I mean, God, I hear myself talk sometimes and I sound like such an actor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but I do think it, I mean, it's yeah. like, there, like in rehearsals I would go home and it's just like, yeah. like, uh, this isn't, this isn't fun at all. <laughs> this is just misery. <laughs> like having to confront yeah. myself with all of this and get yelled at and, you know. Um... <laughs> God, I'm really talking myself out no, of going to the theater this, tonight. <laughs> um, but that's what it's like on a day before you have to go to the theater at night. It's like, why? Why would I do that? Why would I? Uh, only crazy people would like kind of willingly, you know, get Say onto yes. the subway, go to work, and go all the way uptown to do this, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, in front of people, in front of a bunch of strangers yeah. you haven't met to get up there and, you know, just ex. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. I love that. No, we had David Tennant here. That's perfect, yes. David Tennant was at BAM, and he was doing this long, like, four-hour show. I was like, why did I sign up for this? But he says, once you know. walk on, he said, it's, it's a whole different world. It is, but it is. you get off, and you're like, I have to do it again. Why did I sign up for this? 
It's like drugs. <laughs> Stay off drugs. <laughs> Stay no, off no, drugs. <laughs> no, but it, yeah. but it is great and thrilling too. It's yeah. like there's there like when I walk off off uh, that scene I was just talking yeah. about with Nathan, I'm about to do a quick change to go into prior one to go in yeah. as this you know you know, 15th century apparition for Pryor. <laughs> and there's not a night that I don't say to, to Brian Shannon, who's my dresser on the show, like, ah, that was fucking great, <laughs> you know, to do that scene with Nathan. Um, it, it, so yeah, there's that too. It's just insanity. <laughs> it's all good insanity, I love that. How do you stay fit and healthy during this grueling yet rewarding work schedule? And at the end of a um, show, how do you unwind? Well, I run. I'm a runner. Yeah. So I run. I think it's, I should be running more. Um, <laughs> you run on stage. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I run on stage. It's, but, it's, but it's, yeah, I run. And it's, it's uh, I, you know, I always think the running is just not about your body. It's about your mind. It's, it's, I run, like, as far as I can. And it's about will. It's about, you know staying with yourself and just doing it. Just one foot in front of the next. It doesn't matter if it hurts. Yeah. You just got to, you know, you know, be there for yourself. You said you're going to do the run, do the run, you know? And um, so it's exercise, but I think it's more exercise for my mind and my spirit than it is for, you know, for my body. And it feels so good after you finish a run. Beautiful. So um, an unwinding, I mean, I just walk the dog <laughs> and I think, oh my God. I have 10 hours off, I have 12 hours have off. 10. Let's go to pee, let's go to sleep. <laughs> Do you need a lot of sleep? Uh-huh. Do you need a lot of sleep? Um, I wish I had more sleep, but who doesn't, yeah. you know? Um, because Pete needs to get up and go for a walk, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I'm up early. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love sleeping. <laughs> You know what I love is a nap. Yep, right, yep. Right? Like, it, like in adult life, there's nothing more luxurious yep. than a nap. Like, just like an hour where you, like, actually get into bed <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon. It just, you yeah. know, it's just, there's, it's like luxury. Yeah. So just close your eyes in the middle of the day and sleep. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the beginning. Growing up, where did your love for performing begin? And what were your earliest creative outlets? Oh, what a great, I love that question that you ask. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> um, uh, I, um, I don't know, I was my, well, I, I was a swimmer yeah. for years. And, and uh, I swam competitively. And I had a bunch of problems with my ears, and they had to do a lot of operations and stuff. And I had to stop swimming, and it and it like broke my heart. It was, you know, I loved swimming so much that it, not doing that for like two, three hours a day was. I was like, I don't think I'm going to live. And maybe that's what that kind of drama was. What made my mother say you should try theater arts? And I remember. <laughs> I remember her, like, we were sitting out of the, in, the, um, in the parking lot outside of the school. We moved around a lot when I was a kid, and I was going into a new school, and I had to choose an elective, and I couldn't think of anything to do. And she was like, you should try theater arts. <laughs> and, and um, oh, that makes me laugh, just to think about. <laughs> um, um, and I was like, you've got to be kidding. That sounds like a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, and uh, it, I, we, we were just gone to Texas at that time. So um, Texas, the Texans will make anything yeah. competitive. And so there was uh, competitive <laughs> acting, yeah. you know, where you would do these, these um, speech tournaments, like the speech and debate tournaments, would have these acting events where you would do <laughs> like, a, like a scene, like a 12-minute scene with your scene partner or like 10 minutes out of a play by yourself in a classroom on a Saturday. <laughs> and compete <laughs> it's going to be the, the best so i yeah i just remember so that's what i would those are the first creative outlets but it wasn't i mean i guess it was creative but it was fierce competition <laughs> with our acting skills i love that how did the alley theater in houston and director gregory boyd set you on your path oh he was the the first one to hire me 
Um, I, uh, you were in high school at the time? I was in high school. Yeah. I had, uh, you know, Lynn Collins uh, was, uh, she was in high school with me, and yeah. so was Matt Bomer. And they, uh, <laughs> we were all kind of right around each other in the same group. And they had gotten in touch with Annalie Jeffries, who worked at the, um, who was the, who is this incredible actress who was working at the Alley Theater. She actually played um, Harper Pitt in their production of it, in the production yeah. that went to the, Via, the Venice Biennale. Um, so I've had some great conversations yeah. with her about about the, the, this play at that time. And. Um, and uh, anyway, so we would go, we would drive downtown to Houston to, and she was such a, a great mentor to all of us and, and taught me about a way of thinking about this, this work that wasn't um, competitive, you know, like standing in front of a classroom being like, do you like me now? <laughs> you know what I mean? That there's, you know, that there's a, an approach to it that is, that is a little more demanding of, um, and uh, I, I think about the lessons that she gave me to that day, and she's the one who, you know, introduced me to, to Craig Boyd, and oh. um, yeah, and those are the first times I was on stage. Yeah, it was like some Greek tragedy you did too, right? One of the first things. We yeah, we did this. Yeah, yeah there's this incredible, um, like the whole. Um, oh my God! It's you know begins with uh, Iphigenia in in Atlas. Uh, was Atlas or? Aulis, that's right, and all the way to and when she's in Taurus. So it goes through the Trojan War and the Greeks going over there and coming back. And um, uh, yeah, it was it was huge, like this huge, and all these professional actors that I had never, you know, that I could be around. And I was like 17 at the time, so I was <laughs> such a baby. <laughs> was that the defining moment where you said, I think I want to be an actor and try to make a living at this? Yeah, I think it was pretty all in then. And it was during that time that I, I auditioned for Juilliard and got in and, um, and... What was that like? Like auditioning for Juilliard? I mean... And getting in. I guess it was like I was doing... I did it on a Monday because we were, we were dark that, so I, wow. that day. So I flew up to Chicago and... Um, I mean, I was so arrogant and <laughs> like... And um, <laughs> it was the only school that I had applied to and I was just like, I'm going to get out of the <laughs> And um, thank God it worked out. I mean, <laughs> because uh, I mean, and well, and Juilliard has a way of taking the arrogance right out of you, <laughs> um, uh, and, and and for the better. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, that's I remember just flying up there, being like, "All right, this is it. Do you want it?" <laughs> but I remember the monologue. I did a, um, um, I did a, a, a monologue from two monologues. One was King John. Okay. Um, and the other was a Michael Weller play called, uh, oh, what was it called? Uh, I'm on Google. Head. I mean, just was, during this interview, just Google about, Michael Weller plays and just let us know when you get to it. Michael Weller play. Yeah. It was, I played a man confronting his wife about an abortion that she had, that she had gotten. Do it, do it. Do what? Bingo. Yes. Boom. Win. Thank you. You win. Um, you win a car. <laughs> Yeah, loose ends. Yeah. yeah, I remember it. Yeah. So those were your two scenes. I know. So there I was, seventeen, oh. in this you know audition room, <laughs> talking about as if I knew anything about what any Fabulous. of that was about. But I guess you just—that's amazing. Um, you have this wonderful stage, film, and television career. So let's chat about some of the highlights. Just tell me what comes to mind: a story okay. or a great memory. Okay. Fine. This is your life, Lee Pace. <laughs> Your first breakout role was that of transsexual Calpurnia Adams, who falls in love with a military guy in the film Soldier's Girl. Brilliant film. Mm. You can watch it again. It's on Amazon, Netflix, for which you won a Gotham Award for Breakthrough Actor. This was a very personal film for you, right? It was your first big film. Yeah, I mean, it was, and it was also, I, I got to be friends with Calpurnia Adams, who I played in the movie. Yeah. and. Um, and there's nothing like playing someone that you have respect for and admiration for and you understand to, to make you feel like, okay, let's take this seriously. You know, let's really approach this with love and, um, and thought. Uh, and, and it was such, oh, God, it's so great to think about that movie again because it was it's such a challenge in the way that this is a challenge. 
and uh, a challenge in, in that, like, oh, what is this really? And, and really what that movie became about is, it, well, it's just a love story between these two people. And um, the politics that surround the love and then the death of one of them, because he was, it, it was the story of Barry Winchell who was, you know, murdered in his bed by his roommates, beat him to death with a baseball bat. Yeah. You know, his brain was like 18 foot away from him when, when the police got to the scene. Um, is, you know, that was, it's just something to take very seriously. You know, and, and you, you get those opportunities in this, in this line of work that, that um, if you don't show up and pay attention to them, then you've really fumbled the ball. You know, you really have to think, okay, this means something. The people who see this, this will, you know, connect that, do that in, in the, with, the, with the right heart in place. Because you started mm. the dialogue. We were talking upstairs. No one really knew about transsexuals and all of this stuff. This, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big movement now, but no one knew when this movie first came out. Mm. So you started that dialogue with this film for well, a while. Well, Calpurnia had told, you know, she yeah. started the dialogue with me. It's like, I, I, I it was a, a blind spot in my life. I was about 21 at the time. Yeah. Um, and it was a way of thinking that, you know, more people are, you know, it's, uh, you know, more people are interested in it now and more um, open to receiving those different ways of thinking now. But at the time, it was very fresh to me and, yeah. um, and to a lot of people that I think saw the film and, and responded to it. But I'm just so proud to be a part of it and so proud when, um, when with that film in particular, someone has seen the work that I've done and, and really connected to it, you know what I mean? And, and, and seen some of their own story inside of that, you know. Beautiful film. You then starred in two films back to back, Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, opposite Francis McDormand and Amy Adams. Oh, yeah, yeah. And The Fall, an amazing adventure fantasy film for director Tarzan. I want yeah. you to say fabulous. Yeah, yeah. What made these films so special? Uh, well, Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, that was just about the funnest shoot I think I've ever had. We were just in London and on these incredible sets and playing these, um, you know, lighthearted, yeah. lovely characters in a movie, you know, in the kind of movie that doesn't get made anymore, you know? Um, so it was just a pleasure to be a part of that. The fall was, um, it, I mean, that was, we shot it in so many countries. It was, I mean, Tarsem is thrilling to work with. I mean, he did the, it, it's all him, that film. Every choice in that film is his. And he makes those choices with, like, with, with such certainty and um, courage. So to, I mean, and it's all real, a lot of that movie. There, there's a couple of transitions that are, that are CGI, but all of those extraordinary visuals are real. Yeah. That's photography, and that's not, not, you know, not done much anymore. Yeah. So to be on those locations in India and South Africa and, and, and see this dream reality come to life and uh, to be a part of it was extraordinary. And then to see the movie back, and, and then and see my friend Tarsem's story told in this visual way was just, I mean, it, it really should, did change the way I think about the work. And, and, I, and I understand my role inside that work as an actor is to really show up and give, you know, my, what I do to the director who's really doing the thing. I mean, that's, there's nothing, there's nothing better than that to just, because all what I do is just a very small part of the movie, you know, and, and, and that movie really taught me that, would it, that it was just to be a part of this is, special. you know, special and yeah. enough. Mm. What was it like working with director James Ivory in his film, The White Countess? Oh, that was, yeah. that was, we were, well, we were in China in, yeah. in, in 2004 and another, God, it was, on that movie, um, um, Ray Fiennes and Natasha Richardson, and we were in Shanghai, and it was just, I mean, 
I was pinching myself the whole time, you know? Ishmael Merchant, James yeah. Ivory, and Vanessa Redgrave, and these people, um, I couldn't believe I was in their company. And, uh, yeah. I love what actors do because, like you said, you get to travel and learn. Yeah. You know, your whole life you learn by taking on certain roles, you learn a lot about just the kind of people you play, the lifestyle you're thrown into while you're working on that. And then if you're privileged enough to work with people like Vanessa Redgrave, like you mm -hmm. said, Ray Fiennes, James Ivory. Yeah. yeah. Well, and to see them do what they do yeah. extraordinarily, that, that's with this, with this play. Yeah. I mean, to see Nathan do what he's doing, I mean, I... I um, I remember when you were talking to him about the Nance, yeah. um, and th to, to see how Nathan is playing this character of Roy Cohn, and he also does that, is just, I mean, it, it's a privilege to watch. I, I don't know how to say it any other way than that. It's like, I learn being a part of it, you know? So I love that. People, like Cheetah Rivera always said, if you're smart enough, you take away when you work with these people. You learn mm. from them and you take the best and you put that into what you become. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You played ex-convict Richard Hickok opposite Daniel Craig in the film Infamous. Love this film in which Toby mm -hmm. Jones plays Truman Capote. It was all mm -hmm. during the In Cold Blood time period. What was it like working on that film? And working, oh. sharing the screen with you know, Daniel Craig. Yeah, God, and Toby so Jones. exciting. Yeah, yeah. great. I mean, it was, and uh, Sandra Bullock was in that yeah. movie too. She played Harper Lee, um, and wow. Juliet Stevenson and John Hickey. God, there were so many fun people in that movie. And Doug McGrath, who directed that movie, was—I yeah. saw him at opening actually of this, and he was—I hadn't seen him in a long time, and I just—I think he's the greatest. Um, yeah, it was—I mean, it was, yeah, lucky yeah. To, to have gotten to play that part. I love that book in yeah. Cold Blood so much. So to um, be a part of that artful, you know, story about it was... You know. I remember reading, my parents had that book in cold blood, and I used to go into my sister's room and close the door, and I was so frightened to, like, open the book cover. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I mean, I can't drive through the Midwest now oh, no, without no, I mean, yeah, thinking yeah, yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, it's like you see, yeah. <laughs> you see houses in the fields that are set off from the road, and you think about those unlucky people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because my cousins like to like tent like in mid like somewhere like out nowhere. I'd be terrified. Oh. No, no. I'm a hotel person. Oh. <laughs> Put me in a hotel. You got to work with director Robert Tadiro and co-starred opposite Matt Damon and William Hurt in the CIA film The Good Shepherd. Mm. What was it like being on the set with Robert Redford? Robert oh, Redford. De Robert De Niro. De Niro. Yeah. Robert I mean... Redford should have been in it. No, Robert De Niro. What was it like being on the set with him? I mean, uh, great, and yeah. uh, I, I just wanted to do so good, well for him, and I was yeah. really young when I was doing that, and I was playing a character that aged, you know, from, you know, 18, 19 years old till he was, you know, in his late 40s, and the, and the, uh, the head of the CIA. So I was like, I did this very tricky character with, you know, this incredible cast, and and Robert De Niro, I, you know, it was, it's like I, I researched, you know, as much as I could possibly research about the CIA and about that moment in time in America and, um, and just, boy, just, I, I, didn't be, I didn't believe I could work hard enough to, to earn my place in that movie, you know? I, I, I just remember this in, insane sense of, like, to do it somehow, you know, be worthy of this. <laughs> Did you know? he rehearse a lot? I know there's a lot of film directors who just like to like just he block it and shoot. Oh, he shoots a lot. Oh, he shoots a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. There will be like we would we would do yeah. a lot of takes of things and and um, and <laughs> towards the end of and it's just because he's like we've got the camera set up, we've got the actors here, we've got the set. Let's let's find out and record as much of this story as we can. You know, let's just yeah. get it all while we're here. You know, this moment we get once. So let's put it down on film. That's the, that's the magic of film is that you can get it down and you can... So we shot so much. And I remember the first night I was 
um, shooting it was this scene, you know, where I had a lot of dialogue, and it's towards the end of the movie, so I'm, I'm older, and it was like the first scene that I was shooting, and, and, <laughs> and he does like 19 takes of my close-up, and I'm like, I mean, is everything okay? <laughs> Anything different? And he was like, we're gonna go again. <laughs> like, like just, and I remember going home that, that night and thinking, well, I'll be fired in the morning. <laughs> And if I don't get fired in the morning, I'll be fired on Monday. And then Monday came and went, and the call never did. <laughs> and I went to, to work again later in the week, and, yeah. and I wasn't fired. But I was just convinced that, like, they're going to they realize that, that they're better off without me at any minute. <laughs> Those voices in your head come creeping forward, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, still, though, still, I'm convinced. I mean, I think it before some of these performances yeah. of Angels, I think, well, oh, tonight's the night they'll be like, what? Who let him in? <laughs> I think yeah. all actors feel that way. Yeah, they I guess feel like so. they're going to be found out, but it's like that's what keeps you on, like to go out there and give the very best you possibly can. I guess so. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, let's hope that. That's... <laughs> TV audiences first fell in love with you on the ABC series Pushing Daisies. Yeah. Mm which was a beloved cult hit, and critics loved it as audiences did. What was it like playing Ned, and what a cast. Oh, yeah, what a cast. And yeah. uh, we had such great guest stars who came on that, oh, too. Oh, yeah. Like, so, so many fun uh, people that I got to meet then that I see in New York all the time because we got so many great Broadway yeah. people. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was just such a great time in my life, doing that. And playing that part, you know, it made my life so nice because Ned was so easy to love. And like he felt his heart was so, you know, easy to love. Um, and to, to be in those shoes for that time was rewarding, you know. Just the whole look and feel of the show, the fantasy world you all lived in. Everybody wants to live in that world, right? When that show was yeah. on, I was like, can't we move there? Yeah, yeah, right. we're like, he's a pie maker. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just, Wonderful. I mean, it's so, it's such a nice, and that, that cast, uh, I miss being on set with them. Because the talk, I mean, because Brian Fuller, he writes like such incredible amounts of dialogue. And we really prided ourselves on getting, you know, word perfect. And, and because of the way Barry Sonnenfeld shot, there was, uh, we were all, you used wide lenses. So, um, well, basically it means that you can't, sometimes look at the actor you're looking at with the camera because the camera has to be very close to you. And so when we were around the booths in a lot of those pie hole scenes, there would be like, they would make little stickers of our faces and put them around a lens. <laughs> so I would be looking at Anna, a sticker of Anna on this side of the lens, and then I'd look over at a sticker of Kristen, and then over at a sticker of Shy. And so I could, you'd be looking at these stickers around a lens and saying all of that dialogue. So it was challenging. Um, and, but, yeah, it, it, for in the best way, you know. Was that a big audition process for you? We've had a lot of actors here who finally nailed like their first big television show, and they were like, "I auditioned seventeen times. First, it's for the creators, then it's for the network heads, then it's for." Well, I know I had worked with Brian before on a show called Wonder Falls. Yep. And we. Oh yeah. Um, and oh, I love that show. <laughs> um, and um, and and so. So he cast you. Mm, well, he. I think. He, yeah. I, I, yeah. And uh, he, uh, yes. Um, Put a good word. But, but no, I, I had to come in and test for it. Yeah. You know, I came, I came to LA and test for it, but I'd never tested for anything before. And I hear about that process yeah. and it, it just sounds terrifying. But, you know, I met with, you know, Barry Sonnenfeld the night before and he kind of, you know, w kind of walked me through how to do it yeah. and gave me some great notes about how to play the character. And, you know, notes that I think about to this day, you know, it's such, basic, you know, just do everything you're doing, but faster. Just say it faster, and it, which is the best note ever, always, you know? Um, just say it faster. You know, smart people talk fast, you know? People talk fast in life, you know? Actors talk slow. <laughs> I love that. They're like, I have 12 lines of dialogue. I'm going to stretch them out. I in know. This, right? I feel every word. <laughs> you are known to millions of fans, diehard fans, co-starring as Garrett, the vampire in the Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn, part two. We have fans here? 
<laughs> How did that film come about for you and working with director Bill Condon? I mean, Bill Condon is, um, yeah. I admire what he does so much. So I was thrilled to be able to, to get to know him and work with him on, on that. Um, uh, obviously, crazy world to be a part of. Um, you can fill in all the, ga yeah. <laughs> the gaps there. But I've made like friends for life working on that. You know, there was some people that I stood with in the battle sequence yeah. on the snowy field for months. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you sort of knew the first one already come out. You were like, look at this new world I'm getting ready to enter, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what You returned to the theater in Terrence McNally's Golden Age, playing opera composer, is it Vincenzo Bellini? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Opposite the likes of B.B. Newworth and F. Murray Abraham. Mm -hmm. What made being on stage with them so special? Well, to, to, be with, to be on stage with them in front of an audience is just the best because they know what they're doing yeah. you know they know what the jokes mean they know about that communication with an audience um that's you know incredible and with that with that play in particular i knew nothing about opera yeah. nothing 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 so i got to learn so much about not only this one composer but the the world of opera the the, the um the the the, the, the thing that it does you know, the, and I and I and I love that about what I what I do is getting to learn new things about yeah. things like that. You enter the magical world of Peter Jackson when he cast mm -hmm. you as you can clap. Go ahead, mm -hmm. as the Elfin King in the Hobbit films. Mm -hmm. How were you cast in that film? Oh, they would know more about that but than I Peter would. Did Peter come? In, Peter um, cast you because he saw you in the falls. Peter Jackson. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, he'd seen the fall yeah. and and liked it. And they came through New York, and I met them at a hotel, and we read, read some scenes together, and talked about the character. Um, I uh, I love the El Elven King in the book. Yeah. So I was really excited about the idea, the idea of him inside this world. I found him, in dark and. Um, like a wild animal, kind of prickly and unsafe, um, but still an elf, you know, which kind of, you know, means that there's a kind of grace to them and a kind of otherworldly understanding. And I think that combined with this real sense of um, corruption yeah. and wildness, like a feral sense, was uh, interesting to me, you know? So that was a and talk about an incredible cast and uh, f moments that I will remember for the rest of my life, being on set with, you know, Ian McKellen. Um, I mean, I'm dressed as an elf, he is dressed as a wizard. <laughs> we're, you know, we're on this incredible battlefield that's, you know, basically a big green screen all around us. I mean, it's, you know, incredible. I mean, it's, I will remember it for the rest of my life, you know, shouting and, you know, I'm on this giant horse that's about to be transformed into an elk. I mean, it's, it's like David Lynch in its dream reality, the kind of, rea you know, <laughs> what this is. Um, but yeah, fun. I mean, it's fun. Those moments are yeah. just so creative and free and fun to play a character like that that's, so far from yourself, you know, that it's, it's nothing but creativity. Yeah. There's nothing but like, you know, uh, like Halloween night. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that feeling of let's just, you know, dress up and have fun yeah. with this. Like you're you a 10 I mean? year old all over yeah. again, but you're a professional working with like Ian McKellen. Yeah, yeah. 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 But did, did Peter tell you like The Fall was this movie you had done before, but he's like, I cast you because I saw you in this and I saw something that would be the perfect match. Isn't that great when you do work like that and someone goes back to look at it like a director and Well, Tarsem had seen Soldier's Girl. See, okay. So, you wow. know, yeah, that's, he had seen that and that's what made him want to cast me in, in um, The Fall. I said, you know, yeah. that's great. Yeah. So I guess that's yeah. the way that works. 
What's it like living in the world of Peter Jackson? Oh, it's, I mean, to be in New Zealand is yeah. incredible, but to be with Peter Jackson and, you know, Philip Aboyans and Fran <laughs> Walsh in yeah. New Zealand, and, the, 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 you know, it's, they make you feel like family in five minutes. Yeah. And, and, and then you're, and you're basically in Middle Earth. Like, it feels like Middle Earth. It, it's beautiful like you imagine Middle Earth to be. It, it feels like you've crossed the mountains yeah. into the wild. It is that. So um, I would go back there in a heartbeat because it, it was such a, God, fun, fun experience. And I went there for, I mean, we shot the movie forever. So I, for over three years, I would go there for a few months. I mean, I wasn't there for three years. I, was, I would go for a few months and then come back and go for a few months and come back. Wow. Um, and shoot different installments in this char of, of, of the character. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I miss it. it was, there was something so creative and um, just fun about it. Really fun. I love it, all of you, like, your elfin ears and Ian's there. It's like, I just think that's so cool. I know, he's just fabulous, yeah. you know? <laughs> you made your Broadway debut as closeted activist Bruce Niles in Larry Kramer's groundbreaking play, The Normal Heart. Mm -hmm. His semi-autobiographical, yes, his semi-autobiographical work about AIDS, friendship, and love in 1980s era New York with a stellar cast. I mean, Jim Parsons, Joe Mantello, John Benjamin Hickey, Ellen Barkin, so many more. And they all won the Drama Desk Award for Best Ensemble that year. Yeah. Um, this was another life-changing performance for theater goers. Was it life-changing for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was, I remember Ellen saying it backstage. She says, you know, you just get one of these in life. Yeah. You know, you get an experience like this once. And she's a thousand percent right. Because I don't know that I'll, it'll ever be that way again. The, the camaraderie that we felt yeah. as a company, I've never experienced before or after. Um, and, I, and I do think it was the bonding experience of doing that play and doing it so quickly, because it was supposed to be a staged reading yeah. when, we, when we first started rehearsing it. We had like 30 minutes of rehearsal. And then wow. suddenly we're, um, we have an audience, but everyone, you know, came in off book and had ideas about the characters. And George C. Wolfe is, I mean, and, and he's brilliant. And um, and so yeah, we just it all happened very quickly. And I remember we, it was just the the camaraderie. It, it, it was like we really were a family. I shared a dressing room with with Jim and John Hickey, and then. Right, right across the hall, we were on the fifth floor of the yeah. Golden, and right across the hall was Joe Mantello and Ellen Barkin. <gasps> and we would just blare music, you know, um, uh, Diana Ross and, um, and Nicki Minaj, and really whatever we wanted to listen to until half hour, and then we would go down, walk down the stairs and go on stage and do that thing. And, and then we would come back upstairs and blare the music again and, and, I mean, I, I, there was nothing like it. And then we'd go, I'll, I'll go out and drink after. It was such a, a sense of what that, I mean, what it took to get through that plague, the plague, do you know what yeah. I mean? That sense of you have to hold on tight and, and feel the pain together, but also, you know, celebrate the gift of life together too. I mean, so many things, you know, marriage equality was passed in New York while we were on yeah. stage doing that play. And yeah. we talk about oh, a yeah. moment that was yeah. to be, we had just yeah. finished a performance and one of the producers walked on stage and said, I've got some great news. Yeah. And to say it to that house yeah. after we had just done that show, I mean, I get chills thinking about it. Yeah. You know, it's, and because to think about the first time that play was performed at the, at the public, yeah. it was right in the middle yeah. of the, the scariest moment of, I mean, it was like George always talked about it as, uh, it was like a horror film. It's like a group of friends, you know, this monster starts picking off yeah. um, people in this group of friends. And it's, that's what it is, except it was real. And I, um, I think about it a lot you know, doing this play now, doing that play then, and I still don't think I can get my head around it. Yeah. You know, the, the extreme thing that happened in this city during those years. Because yeah. we remember sitting there in the audience of the public, 
my husband, uh, Joe, you were down there too. But it was like to go back and see this show again. The lights would come up at the end of the, your production of The Normal Heart. Everybody just sat there. The whole audience, nobody wanted to leave the Golden Theater. It was the most amazing yeah. thing that could I happen. remember because also uh, you would, we would, because uh, we were on stage a lot of the time yeah. when other scenes were happening. And so I could watch John Hickey do that incredible last act of, I get chills again yeah. thinking about that, watching him go through those stages of illness yeah. um, to see this very healthy living man just shrink and... I mean, it was, because it was just John doing that. Like, he was just doing it with his mind. And, I mean, it was magical, actually, and heartbreaking. But, and I remember, I would stand next to Jim during those moments, and the light would spill off the stage into the audience. And there would be very young people who, I mean, were blessed never to have, you know, been touched by the plague, sitting next to people who had lived through it. And... Yeah you would see that together and that was meaningful. Or you would see someone who's, you know, ill in the audience. I remember one time walking off stage with Jim and we had both seen the same man in the audience and we just started bawling yeah. to see this survivor, yeah. you know, this person who had, who had done it, you know, who had lived when, I mean, that, I mean to survive the thing. Yeah. I mean, that's what's, the story really is, that's what the story of Angels in America, I think, really is, is that, that the strength of spirit that it takes to survive it, to survive this life, not just the, the illness, which, you know, Andrew does so beautifully, you know, in the last acts of, of this play, of showing this, like, how do you live with that death right on the other side of the door, you know? How do you do it? What strength do you pull on? Um, I, I find it moving watching Andrew do that every night, but I think all the characters do that. I think that's what Joe is facing every night, yeah. is this sense of, I'm going to die. I mean, we're all going to die. No, no one's getting out alive, but it's like that's that mortality right there. How do I make it right? Yeah. How do I make it right before that comes? What is the right thing to do, you know? Oh, You've been blessed twice. I, can't believe I, I know. To go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I had Jim here, and Jim talked about. It. He said it's probably the greatest thing he's ever done. I know. I, I feel the same he about it. There's, just, there's a, there was such a spirit in that room there, of with the audience and all of us. Yeah. It just felt like George and Joe, and then to watch Joe Mantello yeah. do that. I mean, there's this monologue that he gives Bruce and. And I couldn't help myself falling out of character every night just watching Joe do this thing, make this argument about, you know, what it means to be gay, like what it, what it means, you know? Yeah. It's such a powerful moment in the speech and Joe just kills it. Yeah. He has, speaks with such ferocity and knowingness. Um, but God, that, yeah, it was, it was, it was just, the incredible, incredible experience that play. Everybody who we spoke to here that is, was a part of that show said it's just the best experience they've ever had. Yeah, and we're, and we're such good friends because of it. I you love know? that. Yeah, I mean, you just don't, you don't, you don't get given that experience and don't kind of have a bond. You know? Well, now you have it again with angels. Mm. So, you were extraordinary. It, you talked about Steven Spielberg's Oscar-winning film, Lincoln. You started talking about what it was like. What's it like working with him as a director, Steven Spielberg? Oh, does he I shoot mean, a lot? Does he rehearse a lot? Neither. I mean, was my experience. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I, I only worked with him on a few yeah. days, and he's the master. Oh yeah. So he's, I mean, he's, I mean, I'm sure he works in lots of different ways with lots of different people. What my experience with him on set was, I mean, I have this huge monologue I have to give to the Senate and um, or to the Congress yeah. and. And I knew my lines, and I had an idea of what the character was. And he says, so you're going to be standing right about here. And, and he kind of took this posture of this kind of relaxed address. And I saw it, and I was like, OK, like that. Like that's, like do it like that. You know what I mean? Kind of that, you know, relaxed, confident, you know, even though there's 400 people in this room, yeah. we're friends, and we're going to work this out right now. Kind of sense of rhetoric 
to that character that was, I mean, just had a good time with it, to be honest. Yeah. We just had a good time with it. So I know your speech, so did, did you shoot it a few times or just? Yeah, we shot it a whole bunch of times. Okay. We spent, you know, most of the day shooting it from lots of different angles and, <laughs> you know, yeah. You loved working with him. Oh, yeah, incredible. That's amazing. Incredible, incredible. Um, yeah, and another just extraordinary cast. Boy, yeah. You get one of these interviews, you feel very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> In between film and television, you always come home to the theater, mm. appearing in such shows, a small tragedy for which you won an Obie Award, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the first time I spoke to you on camera. I yeah, think it was yeah. fabulous. Uh, Guardians, for which you received a Lortel nomination, and the fourth sister at the Vineyard. Why do you always find time to come home to the theater? Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I do love, I'm just scared about tonight, guys. That's all. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> I get scared every day about it, yeah. but it's, but it's, um, it'll be all right. Um, uh, I, um, but I don't know. It's important. I don't know. Yeah. But it's important. I, I value it so much. You know what it is? It's about community. And I, and I, I, sometimes being a part of um, movies and, and television shows, the community is very, very spread out. And, um, and this community in New York City means a lot to me. Yeah. And it's meant a lot to me before I even came to New York City. I mean, I remember when I was in you know, high school, I, we knew the plays that were happening here. We watched the Tonys, even though we would never see any of the act performances that were winning things. We never, it's like, for some reason it was, and I had opinions about it for some reason. <laughs> you know, it's like opinions about plays I'd never even seen. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I've been wanting to be a part of this community for a long time, and 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 um, and, it, and I it means it, I really value yeah. being able to come back, um, and in off Broadway and on Broadway because oh, yeah. I mean this is it's special, like that that in these you know fifteen blocks or oh. or however however many blocks it is there are these theaters that you know over all of these years have just seen so many incredible performances and so many incredible productions. I mean, the theater that we're in, it was, I mean, it saw the Broadway debut of Ethel Merman, yeah. of Matthew Broderick, yeah. of Liza Minnelli, yeah. like on that yeah. stage, yeah. you know? I find, I find that exciting. I'm excited to be a part of that, um, that history that you get on Broadway, but it's not just about the productions. It's not just about the actors. It's about the the audience. This this connoisseurship of people who show up to the plays. You know, it, it, the, you know this season. If you care about American theater, you're not going to miss Angels in America. You know, if you care about American theater, you're not going to miss Bernadette Peters doing Hello Dolly. Yeah. You you have to show up to these things. You know, that's what the community is. And, I, and, I, and I'm, um, yes, lucky to be a participant in it. Beautifully put. One of my favorite TV shows of yours, and of course many people here, AMC's Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, what a great role. What was it like playing Joe McMillan? Um, yeah, he was, a, he was yeah. a complicated son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Are those um, the best types of roles to play when they have a lot of stuff going on with them? Yeah, yeah. But what's great about him is that he was so enigmatic, and it felt like a character that we could, even from the beginning, do anything with. Like, he's someone that um, operates on all systems. He's, you know, he's, he's got elements of the Elven King in him. Yeah. He's, he's dangerous, <laughs> and he's... Um, uh, <laughs> but a world changer, you know, or aspiring to be a world changer. One of the things I loved about Joe McMillan is that he lost, yeah. you know? It's that, that the, I think the real story of American entrepreneurship is the story of failure, actually. You know, there's for every Steve Jobs, yeah. there are a ton of Joe McMillans. And uh, I, I, I find that once, that's what the story became about to me is this, it's not mediocrity, it's, it's 
because he's right, Joe. He's always right. Um, it's this r being right at the wrong time, yeah. you know, or missing the moment somehow, or just not, or being unlucky, you know, just unlucky in life. That's real. Uh, I, I, there, there was such humanity that I learned about him. And, I, and, I, and in that first season, I don't know that I understood the humanity as I then understood it in the third and fourth season. But by then, it was like, I felt like this real sense of brotherhood with Joe Mack, you know? This guy who hadn't quite figured out how to be human. You know. you know, it's interesting. I went back to watch the series. I love watching series when they first start out because as an audience and watching you create what you, you take the same journey of your self-discovery mm -hmm. with a character as you watch a show. Don't you think that as an audience member? Yeah. So when you said you didn't, weren't totally connected with where he was going. But I don't think he was at that yeah, moment exactly. either. Yeah, exactly. He wasn't either. Yeah, yeah. Like Joe was too, he thought yeah. that to get through it, similar to Joe. Yeah. Pit in this in, in the play that I'm doing now yeah. is that you think, well, Moscow, if we just get there, it'll all be yeah. fine. If I can just be that person, I'll be safe. You know, they all of those humans seem to be doing it in the right way. Yeah. So if I just ape what they're doing, maybe I'll have money and love and yeah. and somehow make it through. Um, but that's not the answer. Yeah. You can't, you know, that's not. It was nice taking the journey with you on this character, mm. watching it unfold through four seasons. It was really great. It was great. And I loved how he ended up. Yeah. I, that made so much sense yeah. to me, and I never saw it coming. Yeah. You know? We neither. Yeah. We yeah, neither. Yeah, that he would, that he, but it's perfect. <laughs> I just, I feel like the one thing that had eluded him all those years is a happy life. Yeah. And yeah. although he wasn't rich and he didn't have, you know, he wasn't the iconoclast that he was for a time, or um, he was happy. Yeah. And that was something I wanted for him. <laughs> Beautiful. You have entered the wonderful world of Marvel Comics, <laughs> co-starring as Ronin in Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardian fans here? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> what is it like living in the magical Marvel universe? Um, it's, it's a big universe. There's a lot, there's a lot going on. Um, there's, uh, there's just a lot happening, and a lot happening this weekend with um, Avengers of uh, Infinity War coming out. Um, uh, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> um, like the first yes. time you saw yourself made up as Ronin, like in the mirror that first time, what were your initial thoughts? I mean, it's like being on hallucinogenic drugs because you're looking at yourself, you know, you don't see very well because I've got contacts in. You know, I'm blue. Yeah. I've, yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's insane. It's like being in a dream. It's actually like being in a dream. And, and so I would walk out onto set yeah. for the many months that we shot that, I mean, looking like, the accuser. Um, so there's like hundreds of people who are on this. Sets are huge, the, yeah. the, you know, who never saw, <laughs> I never actually got to shake their hands as a human, you know. <laughs> Actors that I worked with on that, like uh, that I uh, only ever interacted with, you know, with, you know, black teeth and purple eyes and blue skin and, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, you just have to laugh because it's such a good, it's a, such a good time. And and what's what I love about these movies is that they're they're global in such an exciting way. So we can like to to be a part of something that like everyone in the world, not everyone, but most people most in the world, the world are going to check out. Yeah. Um, is is pretty exciting. It's pretty. There's there's something really really cool about that. And 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 with um, and, and, and I, with like Black Panther that I saw rec recently, I thought it was, I wish that, that I had seen that movie when I was a kid. So I think about my, my nephews and nieces watching that movie today, and I'm just like, that's good. I'm proud to be a part of that world. Yeah. You know, I'm proud to be a part of that. Because Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart said, it's this whole other universe, but it's a great place to live in. 
Exactly. It's, I mean, it's like, it's like myth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's modern, contemporary myth, you know, big storytelling about, and our values, yeah. really. When stories are told in that way, that big way, it's like you really get a message about this is what we, the inhabitants of Earth right now, care about. Yeah. You know, this is this is important to us. This is the way, you know, we are understanding right from wrong. Are you starting Captain Marvel next? Is there yes. a new movie? Yes. Can you there tell us is. anything? I don't it only know goes anything. out to the universe. Not about what you're playing, but when you're filming. Huh? Can we when I'm filming? When you're filming it? Oh, that's boring. Who wants to know when I'm filming? <laughs> I'm filming while I'm doing Angels. See? That's one of the things. So, Isn't that amazing that he's going to be doing the show and filming? I know. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, you know what? It'll be really fun. It'll be so fun to, like, to, 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 get, to get back into that world. I mean, it'll be a nice break. <laughs> See what you signed up for as an actor? Oh, God. This is to, I just keep thinking about it. It's only a few hours away. It's only a few hours away. Because tonight is Perestroika. Oh. <laughs> You're going. Some, look, they're, they're going tonight. Oh, are y'all going tonight? Yeah. Are y'all people who saw it last night are coming back tonight? Or <laughs> you'll be there? Well, you're there a lot. You know? You know? This is your second, your second time from Toronto? Yeah. But still, that's a lot. It's that's a good. Time. That's good. <laughs> okay, good. Listen, we Thank have you. a question from the, the audience. Um, what do you remember about your first day at Angels in America on stage doing this show, and how has it changed? Oh, it was your terrifying. Performance. Okay. It was absolutely terrifying to be, I mean, and they'd all done it. Yeah. yeah. You know, because they'd all done it in, at the National. So, you know, I, I just hadn't done it. So I, I was, you really felt that sense of what the hell is going to happen out there? Is it going to go the way we rehearsed it? Which it did. And it was, it, you know, it was terrifying and thrilling and that great sense of, you know, which you never get again you know, really that, you know, your palms are sweating and you're backstage going, okay, now it's this scene. You know, now it's that scene. Okay, there's, you know, that's about to happen. You know, it, it's a lot, but then it finished and the sound the audience made on that first day, I mean, it was, it, you know, I'd never heard anything like it. It was different at Normal Heart. You know, the kind of that stunned sense of like emotion and agony. This, there, there was this, everyone just kind of, you know, and that was, it's emotional to be, after having done all of that, see the audience respond in that way. So, um, and a real sense of teamwork, you know, because you just, everyone is doing their character and you should see the machine backstage of people. You pass the same people as you cross under stage that you pass every night. Um, everyone kind of working well together to, uh, to, to make this thing happen. And not just the actors, everyone backstage and, you know, a lot of designers that have, you know, come over from London to put this together. And that's really what is, you know, what feels good about, you know, you don't want to do one of these things by yourself. Sure. You know, part of it is the joy of getting to, to work with people. Another question do. is, do you like to audition? Were you always good at it? No. <laughs> no, I don't like to audition. <laughs> Who likes to audition? Some actors we've had here love it. And no. other people are like, I don't think so. No, I don't. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to. <laughs> No, it's much better to play it, to play the roles. You know, I don't, um, and I don't even, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm only, I'm not always, I'm not good at it. I wouldn't say good at auditioning. I actually think somehow I get roles in spite of auditioning, you know, <laughs> for some reason. You know, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm good at it at all, actually. It's, it, it feels like I'm back in like the high school forensic Acting, you know, kind of standing the in there by yourself with stuff you prepared by yourself. That's not anything what it's like when you actually do it. When you do it, you're not by yourself at all. You're working yeah. with, I mean, I would say, like, just to go back to those scenes with Nathan, it, I mean, everything that I'm doing is him. Everything is response to what, what, what he's doing and th kind of thinking together, 
That's how you create those alive moments. Auditioning is nothing like that. It's by yourself. It's like acting for, you know, for a mirror. There's, that's no fun. Yeah. You know? Another question is, when you create a character, do you create them all the same way? Like when you're working on a character, is it the text? Like how do you create? Uh, I mean, it's always, it's always different. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't, there's no map. I don't, I don't think, I think that there's, well, there's just, the, the, I mean, the director really, I mean, that's where it all, and the things that you find out and the things that inspire you and the research that you do, because you just find yourself, you know, learning things and remembering things and thinking about your life in, in different ways. And, you know, it's always different. I mean, the only thing that's the same is that, you know, I, you just, Think about it all the time. When it's something you really care about, when it's something really worth doing, you can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. And that's really the process, is you know, walking the dog and thinking about it and staying up at night thinking about it. And um, you know, thinking about it when you ride your bike around town, thinking about it and talking about it with the people you're working with and the people you're not working with, you're just talking about it with. To, it's just thinking about it is the process. Like living in the world of that character 24 7. Well, yeah, just thinking yeah. about, yeah, being, cre letting your mind kind of just do what it does, yeah. you know, and structuring that in a way. But I mean, that's all you really have up there, you know, and when you're playing the character is, is your mind. My final question is what is the best bit of advice that you've been given that you live by, either personally or professionally? Oh, don't take yourself so seriously. That's, I think, a big one. Be nice to people. Um, I mean, no, I mean, boy, you meet some assholes in this job. <laughs> so, you know, be nice. And because and, we're so lucky to get to do this. We're so lucky to be, um, uh, to be able to tell stories for a living, you know what I mean? And, and, and enjoy it. That's the best piece of advice. Like, remember it and enjoy it, you know? Don't complain about stuff. Who cares, you know? That's, just have a good attitude, I guess. But that's you know, for anything, yeah. you know? It's... I love it. <laughs> I have to tell you, Richard, this has you. been one of the most insightful afternoons. I have done this for a long time. This has been a real dream of mine to sit oh, with you. Thank you, thank so you very much. much. Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Pace. Oh, Go see him in Angels you. in America.